Kathy. Um, so Angela's um, from the UK originally, now living um, in um, Te Ika Maui, or the North Island of New Zealand. Um, Lynn's from Britain as well originally, now living in Melbourne, Australia, and Carol is from San Francisco originally? No? Pardon? Everywhere, everywhere originally, now living in Eugene, Oregon, and um, so we're just so thrilled that they could all be here this morning. So Angela's uh, presentation this morning is called Still, Stilled Lives. Um, now, as I've said, she's an artist, but a Angela's also an animal advocate and activist. Um, and she's explored the human-animal relationship in her work since the uh, mid-1990s. She's concerned with the ethical and epistemological consequences of humans using non-human animal life and the role that humans play in the exploitation and destruction of animals and of our environment. Now, her artwork's featured in a number of books and has been included in recent exhibitions, Curious Creatures and Marvellous Monsters. Museum of New Zealand to Papa Tongarewa, Wellington, that was 2018. Uh, the Sexual Politics of Meat exhibition at the Animal Museum Los Angeles in 2017. Dead Animals or the Curious Occurrence of Taxidermy in Contemporary Art at the David Winton Bell Gallery in Providence, Rhode Island. And she's um, just, we're, amazing, we're amazed that she's here today because she's actually been this week installing an exhibition uh, in Wellington, so, which is due to be launched tomorrow morning? Saturday. Saturday morning, sorry, Saturday morning. So she's, we're really lucky she's been able to come for a couple of days in between um, setting up her exhibition um, in Wellington. So I'm very, very honoured to welcome Angela Singer. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou kato. Thank you, Annie, for that kind introduction. I wrote that right there, so it's just as well it was a kind introduction. <laughs> um, I'm an artist, I'm not an academic, um, and my heart's beating really fast because I'm a nervous public speaker. Um, so just a heads up if I sound very, very nervous. I am confident in the art, just not in this. <laughs> this morning I'm going to discuss some of my artwork which combines mixed media with recycled vintage taxidermy to address taxidermic meaning. I'll be focusing on some of my dear trophy works and two recent exhibitions. I'll come straight to the disclaimer now, which is also quite prominent on my website, and that is that I'm not a taxidermist. I've never had an animal taxidermied for my art. I, um, I've never had a living creature harmed or killed for my art, and I will not work with living creatures. So why am I an animal advocate um, using vintage taxidermy? Well, returning to New Zealand from Australia in the mid-1990s, I was disturbed to find that um, trophy taxidermy in particular was ubiquitous. Severed heads were hanging in the homes of friends, they were in restaurants, they were in pubs, they were in the local library, the council offices, the local high school. It just seemed that they were everywhere and I can't recall that when I lived in New Zealand um, when I was younger. Even on the street, I would find taxidermy heads propped up staring out of rubbish skips. And when I had the opportunity to question people as to why there was a head on, the, on their wall, I was met with the responses that were detached, they were disinterested and they were indifferent. It seemed that living with stuffed dead animals was so commonplace that people no longer seemed to see the animal. On reflection, as someone concerned with the human, non-human animal relationship, I thought, well, perhaps um, I was particularly sensitised to animals and maybe taxidermy wasn't quite as prevalent as I thought. Historian Kate Hunter, when researching her book, Hunting a New Zealand History in 2009, said that she was surprised to find that hunting was so ingrained in New Zealand culture she writes, everywhere I looked, I found hunting and hunters. Old cookery books instructed people on how to cook kereru, that's New Zealand pigeon. Children's books made heroes of hunters. Popular magazines from the 1870s to the 1940s carried stories. 
debates and opinions about hunting and the relative merits of hunting tourism and conservation, along with advertisements for fur coats, for firearms and taxidermy services. The entries by trampers in tramping hut books recorded numbers of deer shot, but also the number of venison stews they cooked. The walls of clubs, hotels and pubs were adorned with mounted heads. There's a lot of mounted heads. <laughs> so with trophy taxidermy so ubiquitous, I decided to use unwanted taxidermy in my art and make the animal, if I could, more vividly present. It's through taxidermy that the hunter creates the animal's death into a glorified memorial. I decided I would subvert taxidermy and create a new kind of memorial to the animal's death by making it not look how we expect taxidermy to look, or even the animal to look, stripping back and exposing what the taxidermist had concealed, and making the animal and the violence that was suffered by it and inflicted on it visible. It's now 25 years ago that I began a series of artworks that address the turning of taxidermic meaning. I haven't exhausted this work yet, and in some ways, when I began it, I wish that I had, because we would run out of taxidermy in New Zealand to be used, and it's not the case. I term these works recycled taxidermy, anti-trophies, and uncreating creatures. The vintage taxidermy that I use is discarded, donated, obtained, as I said, from rubbish tips, but also by advertising in local newspapers and at shopping centre notice boards. To those that respond to my ads, I explain that I am an artist and I'm concerned with the rights of animals and that I wish to use their taxidermy in my artwork. I find that most people are keen to get rid of the taxidermy. They no longer want to live with dead animals. When I collect the donated taxidermy, it became obvious to me that the owners of it wanted to share the backstory and the history of the death of the animal. I began to collect these, and I still do, and I use them to inform the artwork. For those who have inherited taxidermy, which is probably the majority, these st um, stories are usually of grandfathers, of fathers, uncles, ex-husbands, who like hunting and their families do not. It was later through word of mouth that I began to receive taxidermy collectors, uh, collections from ex-hunters. Talking with ex-hunters, it can take some prompting to get them to share the story of how the animal was killed. It is a narrative that they no longer wish to recall. I have found most ex-hunters are usually not open to discussing why they actually began hunting, other than perhaps stating that all the men in their family hunted. As one explained to me, boys were expected to go on hunts when they were about five years old, and you were there to shoot the birds, the rabbits, and the possums. Once you got older, and by old, older he meant about the age 15, 16, you got a more powerful gun, and then you were expected to also shoot the deer. Mostly you shot the fawns. As a youngster, he said, I didn't think too much about it, or else I couldn't pull the trigger. None of these ex-hunters have ever told me that they actually delighted in killing. A few who have engaged me, with me on their motivations for hunting say they had no destructive or hateful impulse towards animals. And they argue that they were seeking to be some form of active participant in wild nature, engaged in a fair contest with their prey. Some say that they ceased hunting because they came to realize that there's actually nothing fair about modern hunting practices. So what do taxidermy heads and bodies of animals represent for ex-hunters? Trophies that were once proudly displayed in their homes in celebration of supremacy, power and domination over animals in nature are now found boxed up in the garage or the shed. 
My take is that the guilt for the suffering and the death they've caused is dealt with by hiding the animal away. The trophy is taken on a new life as an animal object, the site of troubling memories, an unwanted souvenir for an experience that the ex-hunter now wishes to forget. So why does New Zealand have so many trophy animals? Between 1861 and 1919, European settlers released more than 250 deer in New Zealand, specifically for sport trophy hunting. These came from the great English parks and some from the Scottish Highlands. With no um, predators in New Zealand for deer, plentiful food and legal protection, the populations grew. In the early 1900s, there was concern that the impact of large herds of deer were having on these grazing land, uh, New Zealand's grazing lands and forest undergrowth. The deer were competing with the sheep and with the cows. In 1930, war was declared on the deer menace. Deer were now officially a pest and no longer protected. Government colours in 1940 shot over 40,000 deer. In 1956, that year's tally rose to 92,000. In 1965, helicopter hunting of deer was introduced. And in 1970, 60 helicopters were kill, um, capturing and killing up to 200 deer per day. Today, deer are killed by hunters, by dock, through their aerial culling, through 1080 poison drops that are usually dropped to target possums, but basically kill most anything, and the deer farming industry. It's interesting that dock does not target stags when it culls, as it supports the New Zealand trophy hunting industry. This has developed rapidly since the year 2000. In 2007, New Zealand ranked second only to South Africa in the number of trophy hunts offered on private high country um, stations. These are known as going on safari. Hunters, mainly from overseas, pay around $8,000 for each large stag that they shoot, with the largest costing more than $30,000. So while trophy hunting is increasingly attracting public criticism in Europe, thanks in part to the work of animal rights advocates, a change in cultural context and the increased sensitivity to wildlife conservation, it has recently grown once more in New Zealand in popularity. There are currently 250,000 gun license holders within New Zealand's adult population of 4 million. Most of these licenses are for hunting animals or killing animal pests, and one in 10 people in Canterbury hold a license. Hunting forms part of New Zealand's long history of cruel and neglectful treatment of animals. It is an accepted sport, leisure and tourist activity. It is promoted as a form of pest control by the tour tourism industry and by DOC. That's the Department of Conservation who strive to give hunting a positive image and raise public tolerance for pervasive human violence against animals. So I want to focus now on some of my works that use tr uh, taxidermy trophies and particularly those that use deer. The images of embellished trophy stags that I've shown in the last three slides or so um, they come from different series. There's a number of works. As I say, I'm given a huge number of stag heads. Um, the works uh, series are called Dirafriff, Recovered and Dead-Eyed. The image that I showed on the first slide when you first walked in, it was a small fawn with a bulging green eye. It's marbled-eyed and that is from the Dead-Eyed series. I adorn these stags and embellish them with gemstones, with vintage jewels, with crystals, with porcelain, with bronze. And I see these works as mourning works. Encrusted and bejeweled, the trophies have an increased presence and I find them no longer easy to ignore. So my hope is that the people who uh, can ignore taxidermy would also find them um, hard to ignore. 
They use jewels for their beauty because they attract and hold the eye, for their association with adornment and ornamentation of the body, and because they convey a sense of value, power, wealth, and status. These are adorned relics. The backstory that informs the work that is currently up there, Dead Eyed series work, is that the hunter, um, he, when he gave me the stag, the stag had the new taxidermy eye. So the idea of taxidermy is uh, to be as realistic as possible. And the new eyes are light reflective, um, just as you would expect an animal's eye to be. There is a reflective effect where the light um, reflects to the back of the eye and bounces forwards. I replaced the animal's more realistic gaze with these clouded, dark, bulging eyes so that the animal looks dead because it is dead. This is one of my older works and it's um, one of my harder works to look at. It is saw and is made from originally an old damaged foam trophy mount. Um, the skin that was over it was heavily damaged and I needed to remove it. And I carved a, um, a flesh of wax which looks bloody. The look of saw also came out of a direct conversation with the ex-hunter around the death of the animal. He explained that after he skinned this um, stag, the antlers were sawn off, and as they're a blood reservoir, the blood spurted out and covered him, drenched him, and drenched the animal. In this, I wanted to achieve an animal form that's inspired by the way the stag died, and I also discovered that by stripping back the skin of the trophy, that the eye became very prominent, and the work became about the gaze. Who is the subject watching and who is the object? I think that Saw appears to stare accusingly at us. W button is what I call an anti-trophy. I've removed its head and it is a small, fragile fawn, not a large, powerful stag. By opening up and stripping back the taxidermy, the wounds that the hunter inflicted and the taxidermist concealed are revealed and I've accented them. I've filled them with red buttons and red sequins. Seen here in the exhibition Creature Discomfort at the Suter Public Art Gallery in Nelson, New Zealand, W button was displayed hanging from the ceiling as if draining of blood its red sequins threatened to drip down on a Victorian elephant footstool and crocodile skin um, suitcase, which is from the gallery's own collection. These works are from my series, Spurts. They are headless taxidermy stags and fawns that have new forms spurting forth from their necks. These particular ones are cartoon-like in their wax forms. I favour wax when working with taxidermy as the material has a, frig a fragility, a resilience, it has a translucency which is similar to skin and it can be manipulated to have a flesh-like sheen. The fragility of the small fawns is at odds with the brutality of the processes of creating these works. Firstly, I have to sever the heads, which takes a, a saw and hammers and whatever else it takes because inside there's quite often wood and metal. Then I have to twist the taxidermy legs and bodies into new poses. Again, there's usually metal within them. I make their stance vulnerable like a newborn fawn, all legs struggling to stand or caught mid-collapse. In 2016, I exhibited two deer works, Spurts No. 4, and a dead-eyed work titled Still, in the exhibition Dead Animals or the Curious Occurrence of Taxidermy in Contemporary Art at David Winton Bell Gallery in Rhode Island. 
The show was a survey of current artistic use of taxidermy and looked at why taxidermy in particular may be relevant for the exploration of the animal-human question. And it also sought to examine the ethical issues surrounding the incorporation of animals' bodies in art. Spurts 4, this uh, work that was exhibited, for this I've used a taxidermy stag that I found at a garage sale. And for Americans, that's a yard sale. <laughs> it was outside of the back door of the home, it wasn't for sale, and the family were using it as a shoe rack. They had inherited it from a family member and didn't feel like they could throw it away, but they also didn't want it inside their house. The antlers were half chewed off, they were kind of hanging off and the family dog had had a go at it. There was quite a bit of hair loss, revealing a stitched up gunshot and knife wounds. When I asked if I could have it, they asked what for and I explained that I was going to turn it into an artwork and they said, great, take it now. <laughs> So using a saw and a crowbar, this one had a lot of metal inside, I sawed the damaged head off and sculpted pink wax protrusions from the neck, and these resemble a bubbling pink blood, a veined fleshy antler, and phallic shapes. I twisted the taxidermy legs, so the taxidermy was no longer lying down in its serene pose. It is now struggling, frozen, in a, in a stance struggling to stand. It is a very abrasive work. As with all my taxidermy works, here I want the viewer to be curious, to let their preconceived ideas of what the animal should look like, to let them go, and to also let go of what the animal's purpose is when they view it. I want to overcome the barrier that the real animal body presents when you look at it, and to look with different eyes and to question why has this animal body been altered? In the exhibition, the work was installed across the floor from a work called Inert. That's a work by Nicholas Gallinin, a taxidermy wolf, which also appears to be frozen, mid-struggle to stand. But this wolf has no back legs. Both of these works are empty or emptied trophies. Now, work that the curator wanted for the exhibition, for, this, for that show, but I couldn't complete it in time, was this work still, and it's called Still Time Waiting. I'm now working on this for my upcoming exhibition, uh, which opens this weekend. It's taken that long. For this work, I required, but I didn't have, a fawn that had a head and neck that could be bent down as if it was weighted down and crushed. It took three years for the right fawn to be donated, and I only came to get it because the curator of, um, one of the curators at Te Papa came and saw some other work, and she said, oh, a friend of mine left the country, gave me a taxidermy form that I don't know what to do with, would you like it? And she showed me a picture, and I said, I've been waiting three years to receive a form like this. The work is sculpted with unnatural colours and unnatural natural forms. <laughs> You see, it's just an excuse to show my cat. <laughs> it has taxidermy birds and it has old insects caught up in the vines. I've made taxidermy glass-eyed flowers which are sprouting out of it. The work is about the role that humans play in the exploitation and the destruction of animals and our environment. And it's particularly about the use of poison 1080. And I can assure you that Bala is fully alive. In the late 2018, Te Papa Tongarewa Museum of New Zealand in Wellington presented the show Curious Creatures and Marvelous Monsters. It was an exhibition curated by Chelsea Nichols to encourage tamariki, that's kids, and whanau, which is family, to look at art with all of their senses engaged. She described the exhibition as providing important, meaty, challenging artworks from the collection, 
and providing the tools to help unpack what they might mean as they explore their own curiosity and their own imaginations. Two of my works featured in this exhibition, but first, I just want to talk about the third selected work that did not appear in the exhibition. Fawn is one of the Spurt series. This is number five. So it was to join the artworks Hedgerow and Nepenthe in the exhibition. Um, it is a headless fawn and it has hands sculpted from plastic clay, pale pink finger-like structures extending upwards from the neck where the head should be. There are also pink glass leaf-like shapes and yellow glass pollen-like shapes around the base. Now this work was shown by Te Papa to test audiences and basically it, um, it scared the crap out of kids. <laughs> so it was not shown. <laughs> One of the hero works, um, which means it was front and center of the show, was um, my work Hedgerow. It's pictured here next to um, a work called Sick Chimp, which is a chimp man who's vomiting some plastic vomit. Um, this work, um, Hedgerow, is not so scary. It's made from vintage taxidermy, um, which dates from the late 1880s. It was given to me by an uh, antique shop in Dunedin, who, um, I can't remember why, they didn't want to sell it, so I had a studio nearby and they let me have it. Probably not near days, it would go on trade me for a thousand dollars. Concealed by the taxidermist was a gunshot wound on its leg, and I emphasise this with red jewels. When I created this work, I was imagining myself as the fox. I was imagining being hunted through the countryside with flowers and leaves clinging to my fur as I hid in the hedgerow. Bitten and injured, there is a blood red crystal bead snake that comes down from the back legs. The eyes are wide, leaves and fawns are caught in her panting open mouth and she is half turned, she is exhausted and she is fearful and she is facing those who are killing her. Also in the exhibition was Nepenthe. This work combines crystals and a vintage taxidermy pheasant head and neck. When this taxidermy was donated to me, I learned it was a pheasant that had been hunted specifically for the hunter to turn it into a bedside lamp. There was a plug wire that ran up the neck and in the top of the head was a socket for a bulb. I used vintage crystals in a feather-like pattern to enhance the bird's own light. The reason I'm showing these works is actually the wall text, so we're coming to that now. The wall text for both these works was created by Te Papa Museum. It was not until the show had opened that I saw um, and got to read the text and I discovered that children and families were being encouraged to empathise with the animals that I was showing. An exhibition such as this in New Zealand gives me hope that our perception of animals, their status and their rights is slowly changing. It makes me hopeful that artists can provide a new visual language that allows people to see animals in a new way. We artists have the ability to advocate for the animal in unique ways by creating work that is surprising and challenging and even shocks the viewer into a new way of seeing and thinking about the animal. It just can't be too shocking for kids. Thank you.